Broadcasting from the Napa Valley wine country just outside the mystical Sonoma Mountains, I am your host, Dave Cruz, and this is Beyond the Strange Radio. Thank you for being with us tonight. The call-in number for the show tonight is 415-891-9083. Again, that number is 415-891-9083. When the phone lines are open, please remember that should usually is the second part of the show. So I'll let you know when the phone lines are open. Remember everyone, this is a live show broadcasting from beyond the strange.com KTLK, the fringe dot FM talk stream live and tune in radio all under the fringe FM. So go to those outlets and especially Spreaker like the show Follow the show and you get updates. You never know when there's going to be a show that just comes through uh, unannounced and you'll miss it because you're not following. So remember, follow the show and um, uh, also follow us on Facebook and uh, you'll know when we have those extra shows just for you. So remember to do that. And again, like or friend the show, all links to social media are at beyondthestrange.com. For those in the Twitterverse, we are at Strange Days 2015. And the new hashtag is hashtag beyond the strange. That's hashtag beyond the strange. And if you have questions on either Spreaker, Facebook, BTS show chat, or in um, Twitter, remember to type your questions in all caps. That way I can see them easily and get to your questions for Michael tonight as soon as I can. And um, I will get to that here in a second. Archives of this show are at beyond the strange YouTube channel. If you are listening on iTunes, give us a nice review. If you enjoy the program, remember great reviews go a long way and they always help the show. So remember to do that and tell a friend about the show. Beyond the Strange Radio. Right now, you can go to beyondstrange.com and make a donation. Aaron, anything helps. Um, but I will tell you right now, while supplies last, if you donate anything over $20, you get a Beyond the Strange t-shirt and a book. Get in touch with me, Dave, at beyondstrange.com. We can talk about that. And I have a 
few books to give away. We got some from Nick Redfern. We have some from David Mead. Um, good stuff. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't give, give away anything that's janky. <laughs> so uh, remember to do that. Go to Beyond the Strange and donate, donate today. And remember to get a hold of me under Dave at BeyondTheStrange.com. All right. Enough of all that stuff. I want to get to my guest because tonight we have an awesome show. Michael Lee Hill is a musician, filmographer, and UFO experiencer. His footage of the Lake Erie, Michael's UFOs, has created a buzz, and this unassuming rocker seems to have developed an intuitive relationship with these craft. In his home state of Ohio, Michael has been cataloging video after video of UFOs over Lake Erie. What makes these different than most sightings is that the phenomena consists almost entirely of pulsating orbs of light and the characteristics of lights. Unusual lights seen changing colors, covering and separating over the lake. Stories of the unexplained phenomena date back over 150 years to indigenous tribes. Michael's Lake Erie UFO footage has been featured on Fox News, Coast to Coast AM, Rents.com, HBCCUFO.org, and in the features films, UFOs Unplugged with Dan Aykroyd. And David Serrata's latest film, From Here to Andromeda, which Michael also co-produced. Michael was also featured on History Channel's UFO Hunters. And Michael has been a speaker at Nashville's Star Knowledge Conference. So re- help me, everyone, welcome to Beyond the Strange Radio, Mr. Michael Lee Hill. Michael, thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, how you doing, brother? <clears throat> Sorry about that bio. I think I might have to work on that. <laughs> the no. tongue twister in it. <laughs> That's all right, man. That's all right. I, it, it, I got through it, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good so no no worries bro no worries but uh again thank you for being on the show i've like we were talking uh we had like a little pre-show before the show and uh i was i was saying that i've been wanting to have you on the show for a long time i i finally got you on the show and uh, i'm really happy that you're here Ah, oh, thanks for the opportunity and uh yeah man looking forward to it awesome so I don't know where you want to start, but I definitely want to get a background. So for our audience, where did you grow up? Uh, Right here in uh, Eastlake, uh, Willoughby, Ohio. And this gets interesting because this place was known as Willoughby um, until in the sometime in the 19 uh, 1940s. And then part of it became East Lake, and this is important because the whole city of Willoughby is going to be revealed in the very near future as pretty much home base of the mound builders, and a lot. So we can get into that. But um, so this my home city of where I grew up is becoming quite important in what's unfolding in the near future, and it's really strange because my mother um, worked for the city in the recreation department so a few years back you know she told me you know did you know that there used to be this indian mound on the top of the hill there and i was like no i didn't know anything about it Hmm. well i didn't really pay attention until after the history channel show which i'm jumping ahead but you know they uh they had revealed some blood anomalies with my blood and told me if i could contact my biological parents and that's when i found out when i met my biological mother and uh, my two half sisters that uh i had native american indian blood and so a lot has unfolded uh and it all ties back to east lake ohio some crazy way i guess nothing is coincidental right i don't think so um synchronicities happen all the time yeah, I think, you know, 
from what I've understood, synchronicities are divine communication. And I was told, imagine one night you had the most beautiful dream and in it you met Source. You met the Creator and she gave you a flower to symbolize your meeting and that everything was groovy. Mm-hmm. You were loved. And then in the morning when you woke up, there's a real rose laying on your chest. Wow. What then? That's what, you know, once you start paying attention to synchronicity, mm-hmm. It'll grow. It'll keep growing until all doubt is removed that something is in communication with you. You know, then what? <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've gone through life kind of questioning what am I here for? What is my purpose? And I think I missed my calling a lot. You know, you know, sooner in life when I was younger. And, um, now that I'm doing this, I just, I I can't get enough of it. And, um, you know, I I really believe that this is part of what I guess is called destiny. Um, but I've never had source, you know, I, 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 I've heard this, this, you know, term, you know, for me, it's always been God. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I've just recently started learning more about, uh, frequencies and, um, you know, vibrating into you know your your frequencies and and you know moving on to the next dimensions it's it's just, it's, it's amazing what i've i've been learning in the last few years uh but uh, i think it kind of all ties together i mean you know there's it's all spiritual right it absolutely all ties together to you know what i just want to drop this because it's beautiful how much it ties together because mm-hmm. the most cosmic harmonious frequency is 432 hertz and why this is so is all of our physics is based on e equals mc squared but that is only the particle part of the equation and our scientists tell us that everything is both particle and wave so since that is only particle m equals mass so E equals MC squared is E is energy, M is mass, and C is the speed of light squared. So what you find out is it has a hidden frequency component, and that is when you learn 432 hertz, which is frequency, squared equals C. It becomes the speed of light within what's an accuracy. Um, and then that's our this is the only frequencies that I knew was and truly a, a component of light. Left is the four thirty two physics and mathematics encoded in our own even system of timekeeping back in Sumeria. Look at how many seconds is in twelve hours. Mm-hmm. It's forty forty three thousand two hundred. It's four thirty two. Interesting. The actual Yeah, man, they've been waiting for us to wake up, and I think this should alleviate a lot of the fear because if they meant us harm, we wouldn't even be talking right now. And they've been, it's clear now that they've been guiding us into what are the most cosmic harmonious frequencies, like Nikolai Tesla. Since day one, so all this propaganda and throwing the Anunnaki and the Nephilim under the proverbial bus, I think people are going to have to rethink what they have been, they've drank the Kool-Aid of whatever they've been taught to believe. Right. Okay, I'm going to get off. <laughs> yeah, no worries, man, no worries. Um, but, yeah, definitely, um, you know, it, 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 there's there seems to be, um, I don't know if you want to call it a misunderstanding or uh, communication breakdown somewhere, but, you know, there's there's – all kinds of different stories about what ET is really doing here or what they've been doing since the beginning of time. There's Mm -hmm. been reports of malevolent ET and there's been reports of benevolent ET. Um, So I know it seems, it sounds more like you're, you're, you're telling us more about ET and, um, you know, our space brothers, however you want to, you know, call them, they're here for a a good reason. Absolutely. You know, but, you know, this gets into a complicated uh, topic because they're here to help to the degree that they've implemented experiments way in the past to try to help humanity be prepared for this exact 
period in time because they understood that thoughts have an electromagnetic reality. We're beaming frequencies with our mental energy and thoughts of fear and doubt and BS have lower frequencies. And this was proven by Dr. Emoto who showed when you froze uh, water molecules as they began to freeze and crystallize that if you came with low frequency with fe- with Thought forms that do not go along with evolution, no geometry was formed. It looked like sludge. But if the intention was love-filled and went along with the nature of cosmic love, you know, it created perfect geometry. It looked like snowflakes. So the Anunnaki understood this, and they said, well, what they understood is, well, how do you transmute a negative thought form? Because energy can't be created or destroyed. It needs to be transmuted into its higher octave. So how do you transmute a a low-frequency fear-based thought form? You live it. It comes up in your own reality. And if you can choose love over fear, because the only reason it'll even re-manifest is because you didn't transmute it the last time it came up. You know, and uh, you'll keep asking, why does the same crap keep happening to me? Mm. You know, it's the same situation, but it's different people. It's because you haven't transmuted that energy. So they understood the help. What did they had done is because of the, even this gets into the mythology of the Anunnaki, we can get into this. But even from the highest levels, it was determined that after the flood, which was 27,000 years ago, mankind did not have enough time before the end of this grand cycle, which was 2016, by the way, not 2012, um, that they didn't have enough time to transmute their collective shadow work. Um, Because what you find out is at the end of these grand time cycles, the Earth's magnetic field is almost at zero. And the lower the Earth's magnetic field, that acts as like training wheels for our consciousness. And, you know, people might know about the idea of thoughts create reality and there's the thought and then there's the reflected manifestation of thought and the stronger the magnetic field the stronger there is a time lag between the thought and the manifestation but as the magnetic field gets weaker and weaker you have less and less time to change your mind that between the thought and the manifestation of thought, for it to actually manifest, they need to have a handshake. They have to have a sig- uh, energetic signature match. So say you put out some garbage towards someone, and then the next day you go, ah, Fred wasn't that bad, you know, maybe I was wrong. Well, when it comes time to manifest, it won't manifest because you change your energy towards the situation. But when there's no gravity you know, thoughts are almost manifested instantly. So you can imagine as an individual or as a collective, if you haven't transmuted the fear and the doubt and the garbage out of one's own belief system or the mass consciousness's belief system, and you come into a time where your thoughts are going to be made manifest almost instantly, it's not a good combo. So these extraterrestrials from very high above said, what can we do to help them? And the Thought was, what if we made them experience their own mental energy reflected back in a magnified way, like exponentially? And what you get out, what you put out energetically, you get back magnified. And theoretically, that would help you burn through your own shadow work at an accelerated way. So this gets into why we're even talking tonight, because the Pleiadian elders – said, well, that's really interesting, but you can't just do that to an upcoming race. It's never been tried before, and uh, it very well could help them be more prepared for the end of this time cycle because the Pleiadian technology of even looking forward in time through the Akashic Records, they had like every like 95% of all timelines ended not good for humanity. So everyone was on board to try and to help in some way. So they said, this is interesting, but you just can't do that to a race that's never been tried before unless you're willing to walk a mile in their moccasins. And so that's when my bloodline decided to incarnate into the human bloodline. And uh, the bloodline has now been confirmed by science, DNA, and you can look into it. It's called haplogroup 
X2A, which only comes in through the mound builder culture. A small percentage of the Native American Indians still to this day in ancient Israel, the hills of Galilee. I'm not even religious in that aspect, but it is what it is, and this is the lost nation. So uh, a lot is about to be revealed, and <clears throat> that definitely can get into why people perceive the Anunnaki as some people see them as benevolent and they've helped us and they've given mm -hmm. us culture and other people see them as the guiding force behind the uh banking cabal and the oil you know cabal and all of that and uh the truth of the matter is when you find out the true nephilim bloodline scientifically proven only comes in through the native americans well, what is us Native American Indians? I'm Iroquois. I'm my mother's and Erie Montauk. I'm my father's. What does us Native American, ha uh, Native American Indians have to do with the Illuminati or the skull and bones or any of that shit? Nothing. Matter of fact, the largest genocide on this planet has been committed against us by the same evil machinery that we're being given the blame to being behind. The Nephilim come in through the Native American Indians, the Cherokee, the Iroquois, um, the Sioux. Um, we can get into all this because it's all going to – it's coming out, you know. Um, I just met with Graham Hancock, and his next whole book is on this ancient North American uh, civilization. This is truly his fabled, you know, quest for the lost civilization. I love that mini miniseries. Right. But anyway. It's good. It's exciting times. I hope you don't mind that we jump around a little bit here and there because we got questions coming in from the audience, and I'm sure it's you know it's whatever's on their mind, and you know they love talking and the chat room right they love on. discussing, and and uh, definitely um, happy to have I you on the show. You know they they're they're, they're loving it. Um, I love jumping around. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Catalina in the Spreaker chat, she uh, she comes in with a question um, right off the bat. Does Michael know about the ringing in the ears as a download from ETs to help us? Yes, exactly. And when we were talking about, uh, you know, the importance of frequency, you know, uh, <clears throat> if everything's created from light and light is created by 432-based frequencies, I can guarantee you that those tones we hear in our ears are 432 based. And um, yeah, that's a whole grassroots movement I'm involved with is to uh, bring back, change our standard of tuning. Right now it got changed by a Nazi to 440 hertz, um, which is what your A note equals for musicians. Um, <clears throat> they knew what they were doing. It should be 432 hertz. So when people start to even hear music performed in the proper frequencies and feel feel what it does to your body, it's mind-blowing. It's like healing just to be in the presence of music being played in 432. Um, yeah, so frequency, very important. Yes, very important. You know, I saw something about that, that our music frequency has been changed. And I'm not, I don't remember quite sure if it was, you know, during World War II or the Nazis had done this or not, but it, it doesn't, you know, wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I also have um, talked with a few people um, that mentioned that reggae is one of the music um, that, that that's at that frequency of 432. Ah, that would make sense. And I can tell you the, the Tibetan monks, their um, singing bowls are the crown chakra singing bowl is tuned to 432 hertz. I found out that a lot of the Native American Indian flutes are tuned to 432. But uh, Chief Golden Light Eagle once told me, he said, but many are also tuned to 444. And he said that was the Arcturian frequency. And he asked me, he said, Michael, what you need to figure out is how... 444 is related to 432 and 528. And I was like, oh, well, okay, thank you. Walked away thinking, how the heck am I ever going to figure that out? Well, 
I got some help, I guess, from friends in high places, and I had a revelation regarding it. But it, it deals with this whole thing of, um, well, check this out. When you ask, why did a Nazi scientist take us out of a music standard frequency of 432 hertz to 440, look into this idea that the ancients left us with this idea of multiplying or dividing whole units by 12, whether it's 12 inches and a foot, 12 months in a year, 12 apostles, uh, 12, 12, 12, 12. Yes, 12, 12 definitely. Um, so take the frequency of 440 and divide it by uh, 12. What you'll find is this 36.6666666666. What I can tell you is when you take 432 and divide it, 12, you get a perfect 36. And all four, 432 base frequencies, when you add them up, they their sums equal 9. What I mean is 432, 4 and 3 and 2 is 9. Then when you go to its lower octave, because just because you got a note tuned properly on your piano and your middle A note is tuned to 432, there's still a lower A note, one octave lower. You know, People perceive it as a lower same note. And it's very easy to find the actual accurate frequency. All you do is divide 432 by 2. You know, that's 216. And um, 216 is 9. And then 216 divided by 2 is 108. 108 is interesting because uh, Tibetan prayer bead uh, bracelets have 108 beads. They will recount certain mantras 108 times but then you get 57 as the lower octave of 108 and then 27 27 is very important because first of all you need to know that the lower frequency the more simpler simpler the geometry you're dealing with so higher frequencies more geometry lower frequencies lo- simpler geometry so if you want really nice straight lines you go to lower frequencies 27 hertz produces a perfect seven pointed star and when you know this and you see that the new inky ia crop circle that was put in italy in uh, 2011 is based on a seven pointed star it's it is 432 based mathematics staring us in the face and then you find out the babylonian world map is based on a seven pointed star um, Native American Indian elder Bear Bear Cloud said, when mankind finds out that the seven-pointed star can reproduce itself fractally and mathematically, forwards and backwards as a whole unit, we'll enter a new time of unlimited free energy for mankind. Um, it's So what I wanted to tell you is when you get the music frequency and you take 440 and divided by 12, you get 36.66666. An Arcturian ambassador, I know I hate just to drop this, but it is who he is. He goes, look at that. He said it's pretending to be sacred geometry while still being an imposter. Because 432 divided by 12 is a perfect 36, and 3 and 6 is 9. And 3, 6, and 9, Nikolai Tesla said, once we understood the magnificence of the 3, the 6, and the 9, that we would unlock keys of the universe. Well, 3, 6, and 9 is another way of saying uh, 432. But what I want to say is, when you take that same thing, if 36 times 12 equals 432, and... uh, 440 times 12 was 36.66666. The perfect number taking on the number of the beast. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? But to go to the next whole number, 37 times 12 is 444. Mm. Keep on going until you get to 44 times 12 is 528. All these people are just splitting this subject matter apart and going, uh, the 528 people are going, the 432 people don't know what they're talking about, and the 432 people are going, the 528 people don't know what they're talking about. What they don't understand is those frequencies aren't in competition. They're not at war with one another. They're both perfectly tuned mathematical and musical overtones of one another, and... uh, you would never have a 528 frequency if you were not tuned properly to uh, uh, 432. But I want to tell you, when you, when you get even higher, you'll get um, 660. I believe that 
it's 55 times 12, if I'm not mistaken. You can check me on that. But 660 is important because 660 is encoded in the ancient earthworks, these mound builder sites like Newark, Ohio, like Serpent Mound, like mm-hmm. East Lake, Ohio in the future. Um, these are 660 is only derived when you multiply 432 base frequencies, those whole numbers by 12. The whole other grid of the octaves broken out of 432 because the numbers 216 and 108 are also encoded into the dimensions and layouts of these ancient mound builder earthworks. One wall will be 1,080 feet long. That's 108. Another wall will be 2,160 feet long. That's 216. They were encoding two totally different ways of deriving 432-based information from something all encoded into the dimensions and layouts of these mound sites. And we just went and destroyed them, most of them, without any care whatsoever. It's amazing, isn't it? Really is. And, you know, speaking of all, you know, the frequencies and and the different types of um, frequencies and our music today, I've always been, you know, like... I don't want to say I, I tune out everything, but there's a there's a lot of music today that just it just doesn't rub me the right way. And I'm wondering if it's because you the Illuminati, the World New World Order, the Cabal, whatever you you know that you want to label them as, um, they're using you know that um, in as propaganda in in our our music today. Um, you know, to, uh, to, to make us feel horrible. Yeah. You know, yes. And the output is evident in their product. They suck. Um, but there's a lot of really great musicians <clears throat> like Dan Reed of the Dan Reed network and his solo stuff is so enlightened. Um, Ian Thornley, um, his band, big wreck is also just, Cutting edge, beautiful stuff. Um, there are musicians, and I can tell you, Prince um, was tuning to 432. A matter of fact, he oh. told people when he uh, started his Facebook and Twitter account because he was anti social media for a very long time. He said, I'm going to answer all the questions that come in for like the next eight hours. And he only ended up answering one question, and that is, should we be retuning our musical standard to 432 hertz? And he replied, the golden standard, and he put a link to a blog site article that was explaining why we should be retuning our musical instruments to 432 hertz as your A reference note. Um, Using scientific equipment of today, which is called cymatics, people might be aware of this, like seeing a big metal plate, they put sand on it and have a bow and they'd be tuned to a specific note. And it wasn't random. Every time they hit that specific frequency, certain geometry would form. Well, that's evolved to the point now of having a big water device and they pump frequency through it and they can see exactly what frequencies create geometry and what don't 440 is the worst possible frequency it doesn't create any geometry it looks like a puddle but when you back it off eight cents all of a sudden this perfect geometry and multi-dimensionality and structure forms and it's all held in shape nothing but this perfect frequency and as a musician i can tell you there's more if there's more information in the signal there's more amplitude and energy in the output of the frequency so for instance if you're sitting in front of me at 10 feet away and I'm playing my acoustic guitar and I I have it tuned to today's standard of 440 and you have a radio shack decibel reader you're sitting there going okay you're at about 60 db then I do nothing but retune my instrument down eight cents so my a now becomes 432 hertz instead of 440 you gain about a third of decibel volume by doing nothing but lowering your frequency only eight cents because there's more information in the signal so now all of a sudden 
music feels like you've never heard it. It actually vibrates the body more. You know when you're at a concert, you can feel those bass drum notes vibrating your gizzard, you know? Um, imagine that when it's tuned to 432 and you're actually gaining even a third more decibel volume and resonance through the actual frequency coming from the musician. I'm uh, I'm one of those artists that's bringing 432 to the people, so stay tuned. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about music. Um, I was going to go into it into the next segment, but um, you know, I wanted to talk about your your music. And um, you uh, had met with Steve Vai, and you you had won um, a contest um, that uh, that involved uh, Steve's music. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. It was called the uh, Steve Vai Ibanez Guitar Challenge. He had taken one of his own songs and stripped it down. The song was called Jaboom, by the way, and he stripped it down to drums and bass. And the contest was to re-record the guitar parts, but make it your own. They weren't looking for a copycat performance of the original. <clears throat> and whatever one that Steve thought was the most creative would win this contest. And you get to meet him. He'd give you one of his own personal guitars and whatnot. So uh, <clears throat> there's a lot more to the story, but I'll just condense it. Uh, I ended up enter entering that contest. And... Um, the stars lined up, and he ended up choosing me as the winner of that contest. And sure enough, they flew me to meet him. It was at one of the G3 shows. I'm sure you're aware of the, you know, Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, and usually one of the best guitarists in the world, like oh, Eric yeah. Johnson or, you know, whatever. So that wasn't even part of the contest. I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to meet Joe Satriani, too. I was telling you, you know, meeting Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and Dan Reed – that might be even weirder to me than meeting the Anunnaki. You know, these people were like unobtainable, just yeah. icons, musical to me, that it just it just seems so ludicrous to think that I would ever get a chance to meet them. And for Steve, you know, to it's part of the contest, but, you know, he gave me one of his own guitars, and I still have it to this day. I cherish it. It's funny. I'm like, dude, I think I'm just going to put it under my bed, you know, because <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to get another one. And he's like, screw that. Play that thing, man. It's made to be played. <laughs> so I've played it um, ever since. And um, I feel very fortunate because these people were the inspiration for me even wanting to be um, a musician. But I truly believe – um. Musicians are like the apostles of today, and the power of music is just beginning to be understood, and mus musicians are the way showers. You know, um, Grant Cameron is a f dear friend of mine, and he, was, he just released a book on where does creativity come from and all the accounts of musicians that have had extraterrestrial happenings. The truth of the matter is that music is one of the only things that makes two hemispheres of the brain fire simultaneously both the feminine yeah. and the male the analytical and the engineering um and when you start playing music as a young child and those connections are made that intertwine both hemispheres of the brain when you go out into your real world kindergarten class that doesn't un untwine you know what i mean so i hate to put it this way too because you can get the same type of interconnectivity between the two hemispheres through meditation and, uh, you know, different advanced techniques. But music does it automatically. And any anyone that is not a competent musician will only ever be processing their reality through either their left side of their brain or their right side, mo mostly. And, man, I hate to say it, but that's a half that's a half-brained human. I don't think hmm. it should be a prerequisite even for our leaders and stuff to be great musicians because their brains are wired to 
process reality in a different way than anyone else. And everyone has that ability to tap into this power to rewire your own brain. And that is to start playing music because it's never too late. Um, and music is its own reward, especially when you start playing music tuned specifically to 432. So I want to develop a fidget spinner that like produces a 432 tone. Wouldn't it be cool? Awesome. That would be great. But uh, a little bit later, we're going to play some of your music, by the way, during the break. So I just want to let our listeners don't go away. Um, you want to tune in for that. Uh, and that's going to be cool. Uh, you know, the whole reason I brought that up, uh, Michael, is because, again, uh, along with purpose, I feel that, you know, with you, music is your talent. Music is your gift from source, God, however you want to describe it. Um, with me, I guess it's talking, <laughs> even though I've never, you know, I've never considered myself a motor mouth. As a matter of fact, I've, I'm the one at a party that it's usually, you know, pretty out of the crowd. You know, I, I don't, I, 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 I like to talk to people one-on-one. That's my thing. And, um, and so when I started doing this, I was kind of like, Oh my God, I'm going to be talking to who knows how many people at the same time. But it's funny because it's like, well, I don't really see them, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> but uh-huh. but um, but yeah, I've I've never I've never been a motor mouth. But doing this to me, I feel like I'm I'm getting something accomplished. And by asking questions and getting down to what I like to consider is the truth, um, you know, makes it, it really makes me feel like we're do, we're doing something important along with you and your music and also. With the videos that you 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 take you 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 took at um, Lake Erie, and I wanted to ask you, you know, before we go to our first break, in a little bit, how did that all started with 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 the videos? Well, I live very close to Lake Erie, and um, I was about two football field lengths away from Lake Erie. And back in two thousand and eight, I was having a um, band practice in my living room. Me and the bass player went into the backyard. He was going to smoke a cigarette, and I don't smoke cigarettes. I was doing the quotes with my fingers, so you know. And so we're back there having a smoke break. And uh, real close to the shore, it was freaking huge. Me and him seeing a a ship show up. And um, it stayed for about 10 minutes, and it was just undeniable. It was breathtaking. And I didn't get that one on film, but it did spark my curiosity for finding lake beaches and shorelines and you know i started going down around sunset i had a sony digital handy cam and had it on a tripod and i would just wait and if a big ball of light went by i was ready to film it and um sure enough i started to accumulate quite a library um that ended up having the history channel come and knock on my door because uh, some of my footage went viral um, to the point that if you go to my YouTube channel, it's called Frozen Hill, all one word, Frozen Hill. Yes. Um, it's over, I think it's 4.7 million views now. And um, so that's what brought the History Channel to my door. And that's what also you know, led to, I didn't know that when they asked me if I was willing to do uh, an update for my segment because at first I was only supposed to be on it for uh, like five minutes and they're going to have a show on sky watchers. And this is the history channel UFO hunters series. And I was featured on episode alien contact in the first season and make a long story short, they ended up taking me and another um, contactee because they found out he and I, well, they knew he had, this blood anomaly because he was a Marine and he had a honorary discharge, but they had found out when they went to interview him because he had filmed the exact same UFOs as I had the same story of spiritual ET contact and this message of become responsible for what you're thinking, that your mental energy has an effect. You know, we're not just observing reality. We're interacting in it, but he had this blood anomaly, so the History Channel thought, wouldn't it be interesting if these two guys ended up having the same blood anomaly? You know, the other guy obviously being me. They're like, wow, they're 500 miles apart. So 
they asked me if I'd be willing to go to Boston. And when I went to Boston, I found out that I was being taken to the hospital by the History Channel to have my blood work and medical work done. By the way, I was not happy. I am the biggest baby. I do not like needles. <laughs> I hate needles I too, like, man. I, I feel your pain. Excuse my life. Yeah, I was like, man, and I knew they were going to be filming me. And it, I am, honestly, it's almost like a phobia. So I'm like, man, I'm going to have to act like I'm a big boy and it don't hurt, you know. <laughs> but um, sure enough, at the end of the schedule, this Harvard professor, his name was David Sistrom, was like, you have this unknown blood anomaly as well. And they're like, well, have a good life. Your plane's waiting on you. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This isn't a TV show anymore. You know, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, no kidding. And he said, what do you think unknown means? And um, I'm like, well, okay, great. He said, I, he said, if I had to just guess, he said, I would think that there is some type of unknown virus that we have no clue what it is. And he said, people think of viruses as like a, a negative thing. He said, they're really not, that some viruses, they're the only things that can work on the level of DNA. He said, he would have to guess that there was some type of unknown virus that was tricking the brain into releasing these massive amounts of creatine kinase um, into my bloodstream, which creatine kinase brings oxygen into the blood. And the more oxygen you have in the blood, because it's put in there usually to facilitate healing, like you've ripped a muscle or whatever, um, the normal amounts of creatine kinase in human blood are 25 parts per liter. And if you've ripped your muscles or something, it'll go up to about 350 creatine kinase parts per liter of blood level, and that's to facilitate healing. What they found in my blood and in Terrell's blood were we were at 2,100 compared to the normal amount is 25. Wow. And if more brings in more um, uh, electricity, more oxygen, more chi, more prana. If 25 is the normal and 2100 is where we were at, um, it was bringing extraordinary amounts of chi into our bloodstream. And um, so later on, after the History Channel, is when the Anunnaki met me and they said, we want to talk to you about this blood anomaly that was revealed on the History Channel. And truly, it's an indicator that you're of our Nephilim bloodline, that part of the deal with the creation of the Nephilim is when Inky side were saying they decided to come in and incarnate. Well, it was a no brainer. They, you know, Inky Ia went to bat for humanity and implemented this experiment with the Pleiadians to help us shed our shadow and be ready and help us survive the last flood. This infuriated his brother Yahweh or he was better known as Enlil, Yahweh. Matter of fact, we're going to get into a lot here, but you know, I've met him now in the flesh. I asked him, are you Enlil, Yahweh, my brother? He said, yes, I've done some pretty messed up things. And I said, mm. haven't we all? You know. And he said, I don't go by that name anymore. No one knows who Enlil or Yahweh or Toth or Ra or Marduk or Ea or whatever. Um, no one knows who those names are anyhow, so I just go by Chief. We'll just leave it at that. Um, so uh, there's lots of reasons that you know tie the Anunnaki and the Nephilim to this bloodline of increased creatine kinase. Because what happened is when Inky side tried to incarnate into the human vessel, there wasn't enough chi available and they would spontaneously combust and burst into flames didn't work out too well no matter how much you want to help if you're bursting into flames it kind of sucks so they said well we need to rethink this what if we made an offshoot of the human genome that has more chi available and it seems to me that the mechanism that was used to create a human vessel that has more chi available was this unknown virus that tricks the brain into releasing these massive amounts of creatine kinase. I could tell you that led to me being brought in by the NSA. And this group, it was the secret group that were remote viewers and did the reverse engineering um, programs. They call them technology transfer programs, TTPs. Um, 
they said that they had 12 members that were of my specific bloodline within their about 180 person group, which was called the Alien Contact Interface Organization or ACIO for short. But 12 of those 180 approximate members were of my bloodline. And they said my numbers of 2,100 would put me in about the middle of those 12, just so you know. And they told me that the guy that was at 12 was at 12,000. <clears> and they said that he was hit by a particle beam weapon of some sort, like the Tesla death ray kind of thing, you know. And um, he pretty much got up and dusted himself off and wasn't hurt. And the uh, it seemed like the insinuation was not too many other people would have got up and walked away from that kind of uh, taking a hit, you know. That's heavy, dude. I'm I'm just processing everything. <laughs> <laughs> man. It is a lot, man. Today's been, I've been just, uh, you know, today's been a day of revelation. And so much has occurred um, since the eclipse. and um, It really has. And I really have such a new understanding of what's about to transpire in the next seven years and how it has everything to do with this past eclipse, um, full totality eclipse, you know, the, uh, this year, 2017. And People know we got another one coming up in 2024. And um, what I've been told is from friends in high places is that these eclipses mark, like bookend, mark the time from the old reality to the new reality where we become a, a galactic society. And these seven years is where humanity will decide how smooth or bumpy of a ride it's going to be. But it doesn't matter. We know the ending the ending of the story. Um What's happening as well is I was just at Serpent Mound for the full totality eclipse, and we had a 1,000 people there putting good energy into the ley lines during the actual eclipse, a lot of Native American Indian elders. And we actually ended up on NPR. Uh, people can go and look at uh, NPR, um, the 2017 solar eclipse they did a really nice job they went to all these different places well what i can tell you is in 2024 it brings the eclipse right over the new east lake ancient earthwork i'm in the process well we are in the process of revealing to the world and the eclipse comes directly over that mound in east lake ohio people can just check it out for themselves there will be a massive event at that new mound site in 2024 and it will be the revealing of everything with the return of the Anunnaki, with everything. And that mound that's there, it takes, I just found out about this mound not too long ago. And it's still intact, still has all the artifacts in it. And it takes over a mile to walk around it. It is the fabled Hall of Records because the mound builders are the remnants of the Atlanteans. People might know that Edgar Cayce, uh, he prophesied so much on the Hall of Records under the Sphinx's paw and that they would leave this library of artifacts that would show who they were and where they went. Well, Edgar Casey also said what happened to the Atlanteans, and not a lot of people know this. He said the last breakup of Atlantis was 10,500 years ago, and the Atlanteans came up into the North American continent and met the Mayans, and they... Uh, Toth became known as Cody Quetzal. They showed him the Mayan calendar, showed him pyramid building. But this experiment to accelerate human conscious evolution was put in place in, by the Anunnaki during the last flood. That was 27,000 years ago. And mankind's darkness and light would be amplified, magnified. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the time period of the Atlanteans moving into um, the Mayan culture, there, there was a long time for this experiment to gain steam. And from what I understand, the Anunnaki was actually shocked at how dark humanity took it. So at one point, the darkness starts to creep in. Watch Mel Gibson's Apocaly Apocalypto, I Apocalypto. think Apocalypto, yeah. It's, you know, it, it, it shows this pretty accurately. So the, the Lantiers are going, well, I don't know why they're starting to think that they need to sacrifice people to make us happy. It's kind of nonsense, so let's get the fuck out of Dodge and go straight up through the middle of the <laughs> continent. And they became known as the Mound Builders. Well, what happened was Edgar Casey said 
The Atlanteans became known as what became known as the North American Mound Builders, who then mainly intertwined into the Iroquois tribe of Indians. And um, that this is what I'm telling you is exactly what Edgar Casey said, exactly what the Anunnaki are telling me about them coming in through the Native American Indians. As you said, I've been brought in by the Native American Indian elders to speak on as the messenger or whatever you want to call it. Um, of the mound builder culture. Um, and uh, it's exciting to me because all of this even deals with the creation of the United States because what you find out is I believe the United States was the culmination of this intelera- um, intelligence acceleration software that let's see what humanity does with this experiment of we the people and You know, that wasn't the way it was in Europe. And what you find is our forefathers, like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, went to the Iroquois Seneca leaders and learned this we the people form of democracy. People will find out that the Iroquois still have the oldest functioning democracy on this planet. And they still own their own land in New York. It's a country within a country. People truly don't understand this. If you go to Niagara Falls, which is Salamanca, New York, you pass this huge sign that says you've now left the United States of America. You're under Seneca law and provision. And mm. there's, a, you're being, there's a toll that's being accessed for you that is being paid by the United States government um, on your behalf. And so safe journeys and have a good time. Um, what people might not know as well, because people should be asking themselves, how come no one knows this? And how come the United States allowed it? They slaughtered everyone else, you know? Um, but you'll find out in, I think it was 1997, this 99 year lease where, because Salamanca was the only state, I mean, let me rewind, the only city that wasn't owned by the United States. It was. Uh, leased back to the United States, and that lease was up in 1997, I believe it was. So at that time, they redid the treaty, and the Seneca were paid $80 million, and they're still paid, I believe it's $800,000 a year back to the Seneca Iroquois for the use of that land. Now, isn't it coincidental that the actual people who our forefathers went to These were the same people, the Iroquois, the Seneca, the Templars who brought this lost nation, the Sangreal, the Holy Grail bloodline, which is exactly the same bloodline we're talking about. They took them back to North America. People like, uh, what's his name, Scott, uh, at uh, America Unearthed. Oh, Scott Walter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, So when you see that the bloodline... Through haplogroup X2A, it's intertwined in the Native American Indians. You find out that truly the Templars brought that bloodline here. So the Templar treasures, uh, King Solomon's treasure, it's with my people. And it's to free humanity from the oil and banking cabal. And it's more gold than all the other dragon families have combined in their combustion. There's That's like the allowance that was allowed for the rest of, uh, you know, the real deal the real gold stash mm-hmm. is meant for humanity to free humanity yeah. and it was brought here with the templars mm-hmm. and man it's all about ready to happen because already at the highest levels of this government they know who the mound builders are right. they knew that this was an experiment to see what mankind would do with it right. and i'll tell you what they said we're gonna have to face some hard facts that we didn't do real well with it and we gave our power and energy away to illusionary outside sources and that shit ain't allowed man you got to work that out (laughs) definitely got to do that hey michael why don't we go ahead and break here and when we come back we'll definitely pick up pick up where we left off um i have questions coming in from the chat rooms of course and um yeah it's uh already an hour's flown by it's yeah i told you it was gonna go by quick (laughs) so let's go ahead and Time's fun when you're having flies. Exactly. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, this is Beyond the Strange Radio. I'm your host, Dave Cruz. We are speaking with Michael Lee Hill, and we'll be right back. Don't go away. We're just getting started, everyone. Peace.
Hey, this is Deb, and you're listening to Dave Cruz on Beyond the Strange Radio. Come own the night with us. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, host of Spaced Out Radio. Every Monday through Friday, right here on KTLK, The Fringe FM, I'm going to lead you down a path of mystery, intrigue, and suspense. So whether you've seen a UFO, had a run-in with Bigfoot or Dogman, or had ghosts running around your house, this is the place to be. Spaced Out Radio, right here on KTLK. Come listen to Lighting the Void every Tuesday and Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 9 p.m. Central. We talk about everything paranormal, UFOs, aliens, anything that's on the topic and finding out the truth, even silly stuff. There's no telling what we'll do. Me and my man Rusty will go all the way to the very ends of the earth to figure out the truth about things that you care about and some things that you never thought about. Check us out on thefringe.fm. We only came to get the this is Dave Cruz, host of Beyond the Strange Radio, and you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. Yahoy there! This is Gigi from Shift Happens, and holy shift, you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. Hey, hey. Oh, yeah. Paranormal, somewhere between abnormal and paranormal. The U.S. military holds the ability to time travel. Jeremy Scott asks the questions that we're all dying to know. Wow, that's a remarkable question. Watch your step. Hide under your blankets. The show that is going to make you think. Prepare yourself for what you're about to hear. This transmission is coming to you. You're riding into the pair of normal. Live Saturday nights at 6 Pacific, 9 Eastern on KTLK, The Fringe FM. Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. We're getting strange on Saturday nights. Hi there, this is Dave Cruz, and each Saturday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I will take you on a tour of the weird and obtuse on Spaced Out Saturdays, from aliens to Sasquatch and every tinfoil hat in between. We got you covered. Join us at spacedoutradio.com for Spaced Out Saturdays. See you there. We are getting strange on Saturday nights. Hi there, this is Dave Cruz. Each Saturday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I will take...
All right. I'm digging that. Welcome back, everyone. This is Beyond the Strange Radio. I am your host, Dave Cruz. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I want to welcome back um, tonight uh, tonight's guest, Michael Lee Hill. And um, remember, if you uh, if you didn't catch the live airing tonight, which is every Sunday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, you can always catch a replay on the BeyondTheStrange.com website, or you can listen to it on Spreaker.com under Beyond the Strange. And also, it plays, it, it reruns on KTLK, the fringe.fm. You can also download it from iTunes and Spreaker.com. And uh, again, we tonight we are speaking with the one and only Michael Lee Hill. And uh, that, by the way, was the individual, um, one of my favorites. And again, thank you, Michael, for being on the show. Oh, thank you, brother. And thank you for playing that. Very tasty. One of my uh, favorite tunes that I've uh, conjured up. <laughs> Love it. Love cool. it, man. Love it. So um, well, let's get back to the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had to. We had to go. We had to sidetrack a little bit into into music, though, because that's that's what I love to do, man. You know, I love to rock on and you know and and talk paranormal. So um, it's all connected. Uh, yeah, the show's been called. The the, par- the punk of the paranormal, <laughs> so that's uh that's that was a pretty cool title that someone came up with. But uh, nevertheless, we uh, definitely want to get back to uh, what we were talking about earlier. And actually, before we do that, um, there was a a couple of questions in the Spreaker chat that I want to get to real quick. Perfect. And let me see if I can get I those. Love questions. Yeah, questions are good. Questions are good, especially when you can answer them. <laughs> and you're the man right now to answer them, so we're going to go ahead and direct them to you. Well, that's yet to be seen, but if I don't know, I probably know someone that does. I call them. I got my my knowers around me. You know, oh. see, so you don't you don't need to remember or know anything if you got good knowers around you. I got L. James. Hey, AJ. <laughs> right on. Yeah, I need to get a couple of them too. <laughs> Bloke from Oz in the Spreaker chat is asking, so um, can this happen in, I guess this is referring to uh, what we're talking about with the frequency frequency in music, um, about listening to music from the womb. I think it would be amazing because, um, you know, for instance, if you take an acoustic guitar and like me, my acoustic guitar, I have it tuned to 432. So it, it actually, there's more resonance. I feel music way more when I play that acoustic guitar tuned to that frequency because there's actually more information in the signal. That guitar is butt up right against my chest. I'm getting those frequencies just flooding my body and my cellular uh, level with light infused frequency um so imagine if you took that acoustic guitar and you laid it on the mother's belly and you played a beautiful chord with the a432 frequencies in it and let that vibrate right into her stomach and right into the baby i uh i bet you it would be a very very good thing for anything actually you know i've heard even, you know, like I said, I wasn't joking. You know, making a fidget spinner that produces a 432 frequency, it would probably cool. make a big enough one. It could uh, it could heal whole lakes of pollution and bring things back to life. It's the way of the future. Wow, that, that sounds really cool. And, you know, it's funny because when I first saw those things, I'm like, ah, someone just got rich. <laughs> You know, off, off, off of something silly like that, but it's not so silly now that you know, when you put it in that sense. Well, you know what? Um, for your listeners, you can begin to work with 432 bass frequencies very easily. One is look up songs on, uh, you know, Tibetan Singing Bowl um, songs on YouTube, or I would highly suggest getting yourself a, it'd be the Crown Chakra. 
Uh, it's a bowl that's about the size of like a cereal bowl. And uh, they are tuned specifically to 432 hertz. And I've checked it out myself in my studio. And But what's fascinating is the Tibetan monks do it by reference. It's all by just their and um tell me they're not tuned in but anyhow for about 50 60 bucks get yourself a tibetan crown chakra singing bowl and see if you can verify that it is tuned to 432 um but anyhow learn how to get it to sing and like wow i just echoed there did you hear that yeah sorry about that bro oh that's okay i was like holy shit i heard myself um anyhow Get yourself a singing bowl. <laughs> that's it. Sorry, I didn't mean to just stop. But no, no, no. That's okay. <laughs> it's kind of at the end of my suggestion. <laughs> no, no, that, that, no. That's all right. Uh, what happens uh, sometimes? Uh, Spreaker's been really just messing up on a lot of uh, different shows, not just mine, and um, we've uh, been battling it. And it uh, sometimes we win, sometimes we don't. <laughs> Uh, It'll just make it sound a little trippy. It's all good. It does sound trippy. That's true. <laughs> but um, but yeah, man, um, that's that's a great answer. And you know, um, I'm not sure because all this is great information. A lot of it's new information for me. Um, but what I had wanted to ask you is when Bloat came with that commercial about, excuse me, that question about uh, frequencies uh, being heard through the womb. I mm-hmm. No, I had I had heard a while back uh, when I first had my first baby, my first my daughter, uh, that if you played classical music, like even underneath their crib when they're sleeping or you know during the day or whatever around them, it helps them get smarter. Yeah, they call it the Mozart effect. Exactly. Mind blowing, ain't it? <laughs> it is, man, and. Uh, I can tell you right now, she is a great artist. I mean, in my opinion, you know, and, and lots of people love her, her drawings, her art, um, you know, and, 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 and with, with my other children as well, they, you know, they're great artists, you know, in their own right as well, you know, whether it's uh, computer graphics or uh, drawing or singing, you know, um, it's pretty in- interesting how, how that works. I'll tell you what, um, our good buddy Sheldon Bird, uh, uh-huh. he gave me permission to perform one of his songs he wrote, and it's called Wingmaker. And in it, there's a line, and it says, The human soul can be seen through exposition. And I said, Dude, what does that mean? He got out his cell phone. Well, let me see. what. Let's look up what exposition means. And it's like a, a showing of a creative output, like an expo, an exposition. And I love that. The human soul can be seen through exposition. It's not – the human soul isn't seen through greed and money and nonsense. It's shown through the human soul bringing something of beauty into this world that didn't exist before it did so. And wow. uh, so yeah. beautiful. I'm, I'm glad your um, daughter is uh, – being creative because I think it's the most important thing for all of us. Yeah, they're all yeah, they're all creative. We got we got five, man. <laughs> oh wow, wow! Well, congratulations. I yeah. uh, I think that's so important. And um, you know, in the past, I feared. You know what? Being an old man and not having children, it just seemed like it'd be useless. Um, but I didn't see. I had almost given up on love. And I'll tell you what, I had no belief in twin flames or twin souls or whatever you want to call them Mm -hmm. boy was i wrong i just met her and i've never felt love like this and uh so her name is rainbow feather two spirits which is perfect because my native american indian name is rainbow warrior eagle so we're both rainbows and twins i'll tell you what man talking about when you meet your twin soul um Spirit, you know, through divine communication will come through nature. It is spirit. So all of a sudden, twins have been manifesting before her and I constantly. Like I went through, went for a walk in the park, and I actually have this on film. Look up 
on my YouTube channel, um, Magical Mystery Mound Tour. <laughs> I did this virtual reality walkthrough thing. But anyhow. That's cool. Um, I, uh, I, all I can say is I am, I love being in love now. <laughs> it's a good feeling. That's cool, man. Definitely. When you find your, your, your other part, you know, it's, um, your, to your, to your soul. It's definitely an amazing feeling. Um, I call my, my wife, my penguin. <laughs> How old are your children? Um, they, uh, they go from 26 all the way down to 15. Ah, congratulations. Uh, yeah. And we actually got a couple of additions. We have one grandchild who's three and we just had, um, a, a new, uh, addition who's going to be two months and, uh, yeah, I'm actually a, a papa. <laughs> congratulations. I think that that's awesome. And I'm, uh, me and, uh, Sarah have actually discussed it and we're like, It'd be great to have children in the future. So now I'm hopeful. And uh, me too. Yay! Yeah, me too, man. That's awesome. Uh, Dennis in in the uh, Spreaker chat wants to ask, and again, this was around the same time that Bloke was asking about the womb question. Um, is Michael talking about brain hemisphere synchronization through binaural beats? No, but um. Binaural beats will do it as well. And when I was with the, the NSA people, that is one of the techniques they used to um, reach really deep states of uh, wavelength or whatever you want to call it, like beta, theta. Um, anyhow, uh, yeah, beta waves definitely will sync up the hemispheres and how they – for people that don't know what bi- binaural beats, it's kind of like – in headphones, one side will be ba- slightly off in frequency than the other side. And it makes your brain want to lock in on these kind of conflicting um, frequencies. And it artificially puts you into very deep states of meditation. And so they'll give you, um, for things to teach you how to reach very deep states of tuning in as they call it um there would be binaural beats and some of them that i was uh gifted actually had like different cultural native instruments like native american indian or Mm -hmm. tibetan monks or you know a lot there's like a collection of 10 and it was all these beautiful music with binaural beats under them with affirmations and things to get your brain to lock into very deep states of meditation. But that is not what I'm talking about with music. Music, binaural beats will lock your brain up when you're listening to it. Mm. When you stop listening to it, your brain is not going to retain any of its ability to um, think topologically. I believe is uh, A.R. Borden's term for it, um, which is like multidimensional thinking. It's using both hemispheres of the brain to assess trial and tribulation and outside data. And binaural beats will connect both hemispheres while you're listening to it. Music or the study of being a musician will keep those pathways connected even when you're not playing music. So there's a huge difference between being a musician, locking the hemispheres of the brain, and using an outside technology such as binaural beats. One lasts and one doesn't, but they're both, they do their, they both have their purpose. Also, they used them very, I think it was, what's the black light called? Black light. Yes, we'll just go with black light. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I've always known it as. Yeah, um, the frequencies cause your cellular capacitance, your chi, to increase, and they'd use that and use binaural beats and advanced breathing techniques um, of meditation. One's called the quantum pause. Some people might know of. It's really easy to learn to meditate. All you do is you count consciously. There's a lot of things that our higher selves take care of for your physical body for you to experience this experience. You know, 
your it's keeping your heartbeat going and your temperature regulated and your blood pressure and you know we don't think about any of that stuff where certain tibetan monks they can start to lower their heartbeat until it's barely even there or raise their body temperature to where they dry off wet clothes that are strewn over themselves the end of the meditation is when they're out in the snow and they've dried their blanket that was wet with their own body heat for you and i that's probably we don't want to take over our immune system or our heartbeat or but the one thing that you can take over that your higher self is usually in charge of is your breathing so how do you take over your breathing you just breathe consciously so i'll do a four count in through my nose like one mississippi two mississippi three mississippi four mississippi funny story i was explaining this whole process to a guy from the uk and he's like what's a mississippi anyhow uh, hold it for a four count and then during that holding let me regress in for a four count through the nose, hold it for a four count, then exhale through the mouth for a four count. And when you're breathing in, imagine that you're bringing in through your forehead light. And then as you're holding it, your body's starting to illuminate with light and energize your body, just mentally, just envision it. Then when you exhale, imagine that you're exhaling black smoke and it's getting rid of all the impurities and, uh, bad stuff out of your energetic fields. So you put visualization techniques with breathing techniques. But what the NSA did was it, the quantum pause came because you added a four count to the end of the exhale. So it's four in through the nose. You hold it for four. You exhale for four. Then you hold it for four, which is kind of unnatural because we want to breathe. But you find out it's it's not that long to go without breathing. But that is... Sounds like drowning. Uh. Uh, you know what? Once you do it a few times, it doesn't feel like it's not its not really long enough to um, start to kick in any feelings like that. For myself, anyhow, uh, for the longest time, I only did the first three. I only learned about this fourth one very recently. Um, so uh, doing the first three is fine with me because it did a whole lot in my life. I dabble with this other technique with holding it, you know, this quantum pause put at the end. Um, because they said that's you're in the stillness of the moment of creation that everything stems from. I was told like everything else is the four seasons. You're, you're manipulating energy and using with it, using it. Whether in the spring you're planting, and in the summer it's growing, in the fall you're cultivating, and in the winter you use what you stored and worked with. But what they've told me is there's a fifth season, and the fifth season exists in every moment of the other four seasons and whereas every other moment is arrived from taking and giving energy the fifth season is the state where the taking and giving actually come from so the quantum pause is the fifth season so to speak and it contains a lot of potency to sit still in the moment in the present or it's just good weed that was a joke. <laughs> no, that's cool, man. I like that. <laughs> really good bomb weed. <laughs> None of that bammer I, stuff. I joke. I joke that's going to be the name of my book. <laughs> or it's really just really good, good weed. weed. Yeah. And every or third, really sixth, weed. every third, sixth, and ninth paragraph will end with "or." It's just good weed. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, I got one more question. Um, actually, I got two more questions. And um, see, I knew this was going to happen, man. Uh, the, the questions start coming in, and there's tons to get to. And next thing you know, I love oh, questions. We're out. I but, really do. It but, makes uh, it easier for me. Yeah, absolutely. Michael is definitely down to answer those questions. Um, normally, I'd have the phone lines open, but uh, I think we're just going to do it this way because we still got tons to get to before you know. Uh, we get out of here. So um, uh, let's go ahead and get with that question. And I apologize to God of Thunder and hashtag Beyond the Strange in Twitter. And rock and roll. Exactly. Sorry. No, it's Start all good. Start kiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's that's exactly. He's got Gene uh, Simmons uh, f- like rocking out on, on, on his, his guitar, man. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I feel what he's putting down. Yeah. And uh, so he's like... Uh, so if someone has tinnitus, 
is it a download from ET? And he's serious. Yes. Um, you know what? Some of it is. And I was told, check this out. Tell him to turn it down. It's amazing, but it works. Um, you can tell ET to turn it down. It's not even, you know what? Caterpillars probably have these ringing in their little caterpillar ears when the universe tells them it's time to form a, a cocoon because they're going to become this new thing called a butterfly. I think it's coding from source. It's bringing in frequency that helps DNA shift and unlock dormant things. People call it junk DNA. It's not. It's not junk at all. Matter of fact, one of the grandmothers, I told her I had a very weird thing that happened when I was given – by the Native American Indians, I was given my spirit Native American Indian name, which was Rainbow Warrior Eagle. Mm -hmm. And um, make a long story short, this lady walked up to me and she pulled up her sleeve and she said, and she had this tattoo that looked like a spade symbol on her wrist. She said, they, and she pointed up like, you know, space beans, they want you to know that everyone here is of the bloodline. And then she pointed to the tattoo and she started crying and she said, it's no, it's so nice to have you back, Inky. And I thought that was strange because she never mm. called me Inky before or after that moment. So about an hour later, I just had this desire. I wanted to see the tattoo. I was like, what the hell was that about? Like, I want to see it in detail. So I walked up and I said, you know, Star, can I see your uh, tattoo? And she looked at me and she goes, what are you talking about? I said, that spade-looking tattoo that's on your wrist. She goes, Michael, I don't have a tattoo. And she pulled up her sleeve, and sure enough, there was no tattoo there. Well, this really hurt my head, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Um, so I, it, probably six months went by where I thought about this a lot, like what happened? I don't know. I, to me, I really didn't know what happened. So I get the chance to uh, – one of the grandmothers – uh, asked to speak to me, and we ended up speaking for about three hours. And people don't know that in the Native American Indian culture, it's the grandmothers that have the highest level of authority. It's the females. And uh, so I used this opportunity to tell her about this experience I just had, because what was strange is this woman who showed me this phantom uh, tattoo, she went on to tell me, you know what's strange is that what you're explaining to me is called the Flora de Lis, and it's a symbol of the royal bloodline, the, the Holy Grail from France. And um, she goes, what's interesting is I do plan getting on that tattoo on my wrist, and she does have it now, and I've wow. seen it now. So um, when I talked to the grandmother, I said, I don't understand really mm -hmm. what happened. She said, Michael – your what they call junk DNA is being activated, and what you've experienced is a new sense, and we call it future sight. And by that point, she had this book called 1111 Star Symbols, which people go to starknowledgeenterprises.com, look for the book, the 1111 Star Symbols. It's very important. It's mm -hmm. loaded with galactic information. Anyhow, it she out. already had it open to future sight. Mm -hmm. And she said, what you're experiencing doesn't have words that even can contain it. So I don't know what to tell you to ease your easing into these new psychic senses that are awakening. Um, she goes, I have future sight as well, but I do not know when the future sight is going to manifest. But what hit me is by me going up and asking her this question – that now I realize was about future sight. Mm -hmm. By the time I was done, she had to book open the future sight. So she had future sight. I would be asking her about future sight. Doesn't that hurt your head? Huh. Definitely. So the whole um, parts of our DNA are being awakened. I can tell you from own, my own personal experience, it is, and it's trippy as all get out. <laughs> That's a perfect way to describe it, right? Yeah, because you really... I wasn't meditating. I, to me, I couldn't tell the difference between it being normal 3D reality and someone coming up and saying, hey, I want to show you my tattoo or some kind of dimensional bleed through. It didn't seem that way to me. So sometimes I think, I wonder how many things I experience truly are future sight, and I just don't know it because I never went back to verify whether that was this timeline or not. You know, That's a perfect 
you know what? I want to segue into something really quick um, because I, th- I love what you just said. And Dan Lopez in Spreaker Chat, I will get to your question in about two minutes. I got to comment on this. Does this have anything to do with what's called the Mandela effect? Uh, this has been going around for quite a while. Some people have debunked it. I still think it's real. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I know I put a slice of pizza in the refrigerator last night. Now it's missing. I'm just kidding. I'm, that was a joke. Bad joke. But seriously, it was, you know, the timeline seemed like they are either combining or someone's going back and messing with the time. Indeed. Man, this is going to get trippy. And I actually, I just posted about this and some people might realize I deleted the post because this is just getting too out there. And man, I almost didn't want to say like, Sorry about the Mandela effect. Sorry about screwing up your movies, you know? I saw that. But I remember. I I, see, yeah. Yeah, truly what happened was the work we did in 2012 with the Anunnaki mm-hmm. was to bring mankind into a more favorable outcome because all signs were pointing to a doom and gloom ending to this human story in 2012. So truly, the whole Earth was taken into a different timeline mm-hmm. through Anunnaki technology and it's really too much to get into, but, right. um, well, I can put it in a nutshell, but picture we were ripped out of a timeline that was catastrophic for humanity and brought into a much more favorable outcome timeline for humanity. Well, there's bleed through in those two realities, which we're perceiving as the Mandela effect. Mm-hmm. And because of, being vetted by spirit recently and being granted rainbow status. They also told me that the work we did and my own mental energy is directly responsible for the Mandela effect. And they said that I'm ripping in realities that are clashing. It's so far out of the box for most of the mass consciousness of humanity that these timelines are clashing and that I needed to start bringing more people into the manifestation of creation through ceremony, uh, including their energy into, like, through ceremony, into putting our intent into the better outcome, like we're talking about Hurricane uh, Irma. Did I say that right? Yes. Um, you know, and focus on our intent, uh, you know, it's funny because Chief Golden White Eagle recently, you know, I was listening to him in a presentation and he said, you know, the CEI, the NSA, the FBI, they all know who I am. But they told me, we know who you are, but we won't mess with you mm. because we know what you can do. He said, when they say, we know what you can do, he, they, he said, they really mean, we know what you can do when you come together and put your intentions together with a singularity of intention yes um, we could change move mountains man you know what there's a funny story i gotta share this because part of my testing was uh i brought in a rainstorm and you know they told me i was known as the water bearer oh, wow. and i didn't know what that meant until last summer and i actually it happened but um you know controlling storms i told you that the team worked with the Anunnaki of focus and our mental intent on the taking away of the energy of Hurricane Sandy. And there was an earthquake, Charlotte, that was on the left side of the United States that had created a tsunami that was coming in for Hawaii. And buoys don't lie. There was a 20-foot tsunami. It was on live on TV. Some people might even remember in 2012. They took everyone on Hawaii and brought them to higher ground um, because they knew at this time there was going to be a 20-foot ball water arriving Mm -hmm. nothing ever arrived because that was i took that project mission under my own wing and brought mental energy and focused it to the left side of the united states in hopes of taking the energy out of that tsunami i just recently did the same thing with hurricane irma because i know the work we did many others did this too i've seen and i said i had a diagram that took the, the hurricane out of harm's way. I said, please envision this and put your goodwill and love towards Florida. Yes. And um, 
you know, as everyone knows, it was reduced from a five to a one. Yes. And and uh, I think it's a very good indicator for humanity of learning what we can do when we come together and refocus our mental energy in something more loving and compassionate. And yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll add to that too, Michael, is that when um, I saw that on, on Facebook, I, I also posted, you know, why don't we all stop talking politics and start, you know, stop um, character assassinating each other and just, let's just, you know, put aside and meditate on what's happening with, you know, these hurricanes and these natural disasters. And let's just meditate and pray or whatever we do. And, you know, and, and let's just pray it all away, you know? And, and I, and I think a lot of people were doing that on Facebook, you know, they, they did for a little bit. They, they, they stopped, you know, I, I, I noticed it. They stopped, you know, with all the Trump stuff, with all the, you know, Clinton stuff, with all the Russian stuff, with all the North Korea stuff, with all the stuff that's negative. And yeah. they put it aside and they started asking each other, let's just make this all go away. Let's, let's you know, let's keep everyone in, in our thoughts and prayers that are in Florida, in the Caribbean islands, in Houston, um, everywhere where this disaster hit. You know, we had earthquakes in Mexico. We have the wildfires here in the West Coast. Uh, you know, let's just, you know, put intention on this going away. And making everything okay, and uh, you know what? For the most part, I think it worked. You know, and I, I think it's you know, and, and and unless, well, until people start, you know, doing their normal routine again, you know, it and it, you know, it it it'll stop. But uh, no, man, I really believe that intention is real, and what you put out there, you definitely get it back. But I got to get to well, Dan Lopez's question because he's do he, real quick before you get to. I got to share something because it's so a part of this uh, that we're talking about. Okay, and then uh, we'll get to Dan. Sorry, Dan. This will only take a minute. <laughs> Dan's um, cool. He's, he understands. At the Serpent Mound event that we were just at, um, I had brought my PA system for the music festival part of it, and word comes out um, Thomas Johnson, who was. Uh, uh, he's the husband of Terry Rivera, who is the organizer of these Serpent Mound events, and God bless them. Uh, he comes running out. He's like, we just got word there's a storm coming in, like 70, 80 miles an hour winds, and um, batting down the hatches. We're getting all the tents you know, stored up and all the canopies and, you know, make sure nothing is out. And um, so I'm looking. I got this whole PA set up on a stage, and, and I'm like, you know, screw it if it starts raining then i'll pull back the pa and i'm like maybe i should be proactive and at this point chief golden light eagle um he's from the he's been on ancient aliens he's the spiritual leader and uh chief of the dakota native american indian tribe he's walking past i go chief uh what do you think i should do with this pa you know like there's say there's a bad storm coming and you think i should pull it back i'm thinking i should just not worry about it and you know, maybe he won't even come. And he looks at me and goes, Michael. It's, this is my chief Golden White Eagle impersonation. <laughs> Michael, you know you and I can part the clouds. And he walks away. So I'm like, hmm. Well, okay, yeah. Mm. Yeah, okay. So about a half hour goes by, and all of a sudden Thomas comes running out. He goes, you just, everybody, you just experienced a Serpent Mound miracle. He said, the storm was on its way, and even on the news you could see on that day, it took a 90-degree turn. And where we were was called Woodland Altars, and it was probably a 10-minute drive from the actual Serpent Mound. And it was pouring and raining at Serpent Mound, and it was totally dry with a blue sky where we were. Oh, cool. So I think it's all connected, you know, truly a lot of Native American Indians, they're known to be able to control weather. And it's because they know they can. It's that simple. Well, you know, and I have a question for myself when, when we come back from Dan's question. And um, it, it definitely involves, you know, intention. And I know you can answer it for me. But, okay, Dan, we're getting to your question now. I'm so sorry. But, uh, you know. Sorry, it's all, Dan. It's all good. You know, we're here with Michael. And we're getting all this great stuff coming along. So uh, We're on Indian time. We're on Indian time. 
Has mm-hmm. Michael dealt with any 528 hertz and toroidal fields? Yeah, actually, um, uh, not as much as 432. From what I understand, 528 will take you right into DNA type focus, whereas 432 is the frequency of creation. So it's all depending on where you want to place your intention with 528. But what was the other part of that question? It was uh, toroidal fields. Oh yeah, because um, you know, toroidal physics. Um, all I can tell you is when I I hired Cymoscope, who are the leaders in cymatics, to um, image my guitar, which I was meticulous about making sure it was tuned properly to A equaling four hundred thirty two hertz, and the result is pretty much historical. Um, the seam. Uh, Harriman, famous astrophysicist, he, um, he's the president of the Resonance Project. He took the image from my guitar being imaged and released it through his Resonance Project. And um, I've started basing the frequency in my crystal disc creations, which embeds this most cosmic harmonious frequency, which the image itself contains subtle energy. And uh, if people want to look at this technology, by the way, my website is michaelleehill.net. And I've taken this most – it's its truly – it's not computer-generated. This is what the 432 pulse looks like when it's fed through a container of water. It has high-tech cameras to record what's going on on the surface of the water. It's so encoded with information. It's Nothing really like it has ever existed. So I've made a whole, I call it Anunnaki bling. And I've put it on two dog tags, which I call Rainbow Warrior dog tags. And I've been already shown that this image itself can restructure water. So imagine when you're wearing this image and it's putting the frequency right into your chest and restructuring the water to be of the highest benefit to your cells just by wearing it. So these things are available at my website. And, uh, Check it out because, you know, there's a lot of info you can learn as well. Um, I really like the idea of my website, the blog, especially because it gave me the ability to put all my research into a concise yet as lengthy way as I wanted to, to release my information to the world. And it's all there and it's all free. And just go to michaelleehill.net, go to the blog section for the information and then go to the shop for the Anunnaki bling. Go to the music section when you want to rock. Mm, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, man. That's that should be a commercial. It really, you know what? We I might just have to go back and make it a commercial. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> right on, bro. That's, that's, that was pretty dope. Um, <laughs> Craig has a question, and uh, Craig is asking. Have you had any experience of love pouring through you and the need to give it with visuals like these other awoken types? Yes, my visuals is actually bringing out my Anunnaki bling featuring the 432 hertz cymatic image, which is the most cosmic harmonious frequency. Um, That is one side of my artistic output. Photography is another one. People are like, dude, you you stop taking pictures i'm like fuck no it's free i love (laughs) i love photography like even like i've got to stop even bringing my cell phone because how my brain works no matter i go for walks in the park quite often just everywhere i look i see beauty like oh that'd make a great photo so i gotta i gotta leave it behind so i'm not so tempted (laughs) yeah absolutely man and Uh, music too obviously of course yeah absolutely and Bloke uh, comes in and he wants to go into the the tech of the timeline changes, and he's, he's saying please, um, but I, I really want to I want I want to make that maybe the, the last two questions. Um, so so um, because I know we, I want to get into Ar Borden and um, Nibiru at least at at the at, yeah, at the at, at at the last thing that we talk about. So uh, if you can. In a nutshell, talk about the the tech on the timeline change, please. Yes. Um, part of the protocol for spirit to help in any way is you have to ask. And that is right down to your life. 
nothing can come in and impede on your own free will unless you ask. So part of the protocol was us to make contact through remote viewing, through telepathy, um, to the incoming kingdom Anunnaki, they called them, and ask for their help. And part of that, though, was you have to give your your best case solution to the problem as well. You just, just can't go, hey, fix this for us without presenting your own best solution to whatever the problem is. So from our point of view, we knew every time Nibiru comes through, it's every 3,600 years. It's not catastrophic. That would be in our uh, ge- geographical record, and it's not. So what makes it a survivable transit and what makes it a doomsday transit? That is the question, and the answer is where Nibiru comes through our solar system. If it's between Mars and Jupiter, then we have a fighting chance because we have a planet that's going to buffer its effects on our tectonic plates and, you know, electromagnetic fields. But if it comes through between Mars and Earth, then we're screwed. All evidence was that it was coming through between Mars and Earth. So their best case solution, if the sky was the limit, was please have a change in trajectory as you enter the solar system somehow and bring Nibiru between Mars and Jupiter so we have more of a funny chance. And from what I understand, they were like, aha, look, this is cute. Look at the little kids trying to grab the wheel and take a hold. Because truly what they did was some people might be hip to uh, astronaut Buzz Aldrin was on the news and he said, there's a monolith on Mars. And he said, wait till people, the moon of Mars. Uh, He said, wait till people find out that this monolith is there. They're going to ask who put it there. He said, the answer is God put it there. Um, But what I found out is the Anunnaki have these monoliths on all ley line where electromagnetic lines of energy that crisscross all planets where they cross, these monuments are there, or sometimes they're in the form of mounds, or they're in the form of temples or pyramids or whole complexes, but they're on all the planets on um, going away from the sun. And they're whole, it's Anunnaki technology, and they're made to help with the stabilization of tectonic plates and the electromagnetic fields of the planets. And uh, they said that this protective system that is truly Anunnaki technology was very – it worked very well in the last transit and not a lot of damage happened. But they used it in a brand new way this time and that is a lot of your listeners are going to be um, familiar with the concept of the Merkaba, which is a physical light vehicle. It's your own auric field. Well – then many people might know too, or not the only ones that has a Merkaba field. Anything that has life force or consciousness, whether it be a tree, an animal, a pet, a dog, um, a person, a planet, a planet has a Merkaba field. So if you if you ignite your own Merkaba field and it takes you out of this time bound, space bound continuum, rips you out of this timeline. Um, it's what they did with the Philadelphia experiment. They put a false Merkaba field around it using Tesla technology back in the 40s. Are you familiar? Yes. Uh, well, imagine that the Anunnaki have this technology, but it's not so barbaric and kindergartnerish as what we did. But so, man, you know, this is going to toast your noodle, but what happens if you ignite the, the whole Earth's magnetic field? takes the whole planet interdimensional, doesn't it? And rips it out of the space-time continuum. They said when we're in the ether, time doesn't exist in the same rate or way of even experiencing it that it is when we're in the timeline. And they said, like, for instance, with the Philadelphia experiment, when they ripped that uh, battleship out of the 1940 space-time continuum, if you recall, it popped back in in 1988 for a brief moment in time. And then it snapped back out and popped back in a fraction after in back in the 1940s. But that's when, at that experiment, there was men that were infused into the hull of the ship, and mm-hmm. it didn't go very well. Um, yeah. 
in the exact same way, they said, when they took the Earth out of this space-time continuum for one one-hundredth of a second, it took us in the ether, if we were to pop back in the next actual moment of time, we would be in 2036 in one one-hundredth of a second, just like that ship manifested in 1988 from 1943 instantly. So when they ripped us out of the space-time continuum, by the way, there's lots of other things that were arriving in 2024. I mean, <laughs> 2012. Um, one was a galactic cosmic super wave that people can look. It's a real deal. It was said to be arriving here as as well as some of the first effects of Nibiru entering. And A.R. Borden's words were, we're going to get the hell out of Dodge, but take Dodge with us. So imagine the Earth's magnetic field is ignited for one one-hundredth of a second by the Anunnaki, ripped out of the space-time continuum when the dangerous shit is arriving in 2012. He said, we're going to get the hell out of Dodge, but take Dodge with us, you know, which is exactly what they did. But now it's popped back in in the second one-hundredth of a second. To us, as a human, we we wouldn't even notice anything happened. Not at all. Because only one one hundredth of a second we were gone. But now we're, when we come back, we're in a new timeline. And it's tied now to 2036, and I know what that is all about as well. Maybe that can be for another uh, interview. But just remember, in a very near future, something scary is going to be revealed to the world and it revolves a comet that is coming in 2034. So you can imagine... If it's spun in correctly and the fear it can produce, but truly our second moon is being flown in, and it's something to be blessed. So people are going to have a choice whether to go fear-based with this knowledge or have the knowledge that Earth's second moon is being flown in, and from that point forward, this place will be beautiful, and the waters will be super regulated, and the weather systems of this planet will be super regulated, and this place will become a paradise once again, but you know what I found out about they call it Hayoka in the Native American Indian culture, which is uh, it's like the trickster element. It can come and make something look like what it's not. It can look really scary on the outside, but it's truly not that at all in the reality of the situation. But mm. if you engage it, it will become what you fear. Wow, man. Oh my gosh. I hate, I hate, 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 hate having to stop, man. We are out of time and that is awesome. Oh my gosh, Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. And yes, Brother. I'm going to have you back way before anything happens. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we definitely got to talk more about, um, AR Borden and everything that we, we were going to talk about still. Uh, but thanks to everyone for one, for the wonderful questions and speaker chat, and in Twitter yeah, and Facebook, um, everyone is just, you know, at the edge of the seat. I hate to do it to you guys, but you know, we de definitely got to go. Michael, where can we find you and everything we need to know about um, everything that you do? Uh, MichaelLeeHill.net is my website. Frozen Hill is my YouTube channel. And Facebook, my Michael Lee Hill account now. Uh, Facebook said I can't have any more friends, <laughs> but I just started an artist page and it's called Ea Rainbow Warrior Eagle. And that's going to be uh, where I can keep in uh, contact with all my new friends and whatnot. Sweet. So look me up on Facebook, Ea Rainbow Warrior Eagle. All right. Thank you right. for having me, man. It's been, uh, let's give a shout out to Sheldon Bird. Absolutely. I, I that we both. Uh, Yay, you know, Sheldon. <laughs> right on man all right hey, michael don't go away just hang out for a second and i'm going to close the show right now brother thanks again for being on the show uh, peace thank you right on all right that wraps it up everyone we got to get out of here we have the paranormal code coming up right now with richard giordano on the ktlk the fringe.fm executive producer and creator of beyond the strange radio is dave cruz co-executive producer of beyond the strange is deb j cruz music is by alan hall and zebrafish visit zebrafish at soundcloud 
<laughs> soundcloud.com forward slash zebrafish. Beginning disclaimer by Casper Parks. Visit him at casperparks.com. Thanks to everyone reposting on Twitter and Facebook. Tell your friends about Beyond Strange Radio. Tonight's broadcast of Beyond Strange is owned and copyrighted by Dave Cruz and cannot be simulcast, rebroadcasted, or copied without written consent of Beyond the Strange Radio. Also, the views and opinions are not necessarily that of Beyond the Strange, hosts, guests, and affiliated networks. Listeners are encouraged to conduct research and formulate their own opinions. Next Sunday, Katie Montana Jordan, researcher, paranormal uh, experiencer, and occultist. So, everyone, have a great night. Thanks for joining us. And until next week, stay strange. See ya.